So when reading the passage for today, as I was preparing for the sermon, I was struck by two parts that I never really noticed before and never really focused on. In this passage, there is someone who desires to build a large tower, but is unable to finish it because of poor planning, we're told. Similarly, similarly, there is a king who is to go off to war, but has to back out, back down, really, right before the battlefield, because he can not engage. He did not engage thoughtfully. And sometimes we're like the man building the tower. And sometimes we have been like the king. We attempt and try, and sometimes we leave messes behind us. Or we have to make last-minute plans. That's ironic that I wrote that. (laughs) Maybe we felt this professionally. Maybe we felt it relationally or personally. And in the living of our lives, we leave behind all sorts of unfinished business. Our reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 14, 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be glorified by you, O God, our rock, O God, our redeemer. Amen. So several years ago, I felt honored when I was invited to join the Bro Bash Fantasy Football League. Now I have to confess, I did not come up with or support the name, which is a little ironic because the Bro Bash Fantasy Football League was created by a bunch of girlfriends of mine from college and their partners as a way to connect across the miles. And I thought, this was my chance. This was my chance where I could become interested in sports. (laughs) I would get to reconnect with a larger group of friends from college and it would be Fun and, and, be, and as an added bonus, my husband Dan was invited to join the group as well. I envisioned us texting back and forth with all sorts of sports stats and funny little memes that I would find and the cultural references that I would now be able to understand. Alas, my fantasy football career was very short-lived. I accidentally traded one of my players and The commissioner refused or maybe couldn't undo what was done, and so I disengaged in protest, much to the anger of the other participants in the league. But I have to confess to you, secretly, I was thrilled. Much like my stint when my boyfriend, now husband, and I were first dating, where I bought a scorekeeping book And I would sit whenever we watched baseball, whether live or on the TV, and 
I would keep notes tracking the runs and the hits and the outs and other things with weird acronyms that I, I can't even remember what they stand for now, like RBI. I know that's one of them, but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> I honestly had no interest in fantasy football, just as I had no interest in keeping score for baseball. But I had interest in my friends, and I had interest in this man that would eventually become my husband. And while my fantasy football era was short-lived, my husband, Dan, actually stayed in the league, and is still in the league, and even several years ago won the league. Upon which, a very strangely shaped box arrived at our door one day. Inside the box, there was a mini leg lamp, like one of those from the Christmas story with the fishnet clad leg and the yellow lampshade with the black tassels around the end. And on the lampshade had all the names of the previous winners. I hate this lamp. I know we're not supposed to hate things, but I hate this lamp. It's aesthetically atrocious, and it is also a fire hazard. You plug it in and it becomes insanely hot. So time passed and it, summer came and then fall again and I became excited as I assumed that someone else would be the recipient of this leg lamp. But the leg lamp never left our house, not because my husband kept winning, no, the leg lamp should have traveled to North Carolina, where the next winner was, and then up to Boston for the year after that. But the leg lamp sat, <clears throat> and I refused to mail it for my husband. It was, after all, his. And I disengaged from all things fantasy football. I did go as far as to find a box to put it in, <laughs> which then got moved from the front door of our house to buy the back door of our house, and then it somehow migrated back down to the basement. But last week, last week, the leg lamp made its way from Chicago, Illinois, out to Denver, Colorado. And I am thrilled, yes. <laughs> and I do wanna say, though, as a disclaimer, we hold no accountability for the potential arson that the leg lamp might inflict on the people who now own it. But this leg lamp haunted us. It had been brought up in almost every argument for the past three years. And it still lingered. Like, even though we would disagree about it, it still lingered. It was this piece of unfinished business in our lives. And when we look at our lives, they are littered with leg lamps. Maybe not literally, unless you're a collector and into that kind of thing. But metaphorically, many of us have things that are both tangible and emotional that follow us around, that we move from place to place and maybe even try to hide in the basement, diminishing and dismissing it. But these are things that haunt us. They come up again and again, and unless we take the time and the energy and effort, they will remain unfinished business. Today's passage from Luke can hit hard. We wonder, is Jesus actually telling us to hate people? Our mothers, our fathers, our sisters and brothers. Is he telling us to hate life itself? Is he telling us to abandon, abandon everything? When people tell me that they take the Bible literally, I sometimes point to this passage and I ask, so do you take these things literally? Like, do you, do you want to go around hating people and hating life? Because that's a hard pill to swallow. But I believe in taking the Bible seriously and not literally. So the question is, what can we make of this hard-to-understand passage? Do you just throw it out? Some might think so. But I believe that scripture, while hard to understand, sometimes is a teacher, even maybe in our own wrestling with it. 
This passage is one that is often quoted most famously by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a 20th century theologian who is known for his writing um, from letters in prison and even a book on the cost of discipleship. But Bonhoeffer is known more for his actions than his writing. The ways he lived fighting the Nazi regime in Germany, plotting to kill Hitler, and then his execution as a consequence. This man truly believed in living so faithfully in life that it would end in his own death. So I also know that there's some eighth grade confirmands here today, and it's interesting. In the UCC statement of faith, we too also hold on to this idea of the cost of discipleship. We are not Bonhoeffer, though. Many of us are not called to give up our lives in such a way. But we too are faced with the question of how we want to live and to explore where we too leave unfinished business. I was recently talking with a friend about her new love of kindness meditation. But she said she struggled because in all these meditations that she could find, she said they were about self-kindness. And she said, I'm totally fine being kind to myself. She said, where I struggle is being kind to other people. And what we're talking about that is actually, the same, is actually also the cost of discipleship. It's this concept of cheap grace versus costly grace. See, cheap grace is that eternal turning inward, the kindness meditation that is always centered on self-kindness and never on the way that we treat others. In this cheap grace, it doesn't matter if I cause pain or perpetuate behaviors that hurt myself and others. Because I'm forgiven by God, anything goes. But Bonhoeffer, and actually before him, Martin Luther, the great reformer, and before him, St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, would agree, this cheap grace is superficial and insubstantial, and that real grace is costly. Because real grace demands that we are transformed, that we have to continually ask for forgiveness, not just once, there's no one prayer that we can say that will make it all better eternally. But a life of faith is about living continually examined lives, where we continually confess the ways that we all are flawed and the ways that we all sometimes fail. We confess and then we are changed in the ask, act of asking and receiving forgiveness. We're free to engage with the world and also ourselves differently. And we're not working towards perfection, an unachievable standard for any of us, but we are hoping to live honestly. So my friend's kindness meditations that talk about kindness towards ourselves aren't bad, but they're also only part of the equation. We have to be transformed by that self-kindness, that self-love that I would say is reflective of God so that we can go out into the world and be kind to others in a radical and revolutionary way, a way that will ask us to live differently, maybe even uncomfortably. In a way, like we talked about last week, it's a way that isn't easier. It is, in fact, harder. It asks that we, too, take up the cross made from our own lives. As Jesus' cross was, made, was the culmination of his actions here on earth, so, too, do we carry crosses of unfinished business that we hold on to. But we do not have to be held by the cross forever. As Christ was taken down from the cross to raise in glory, new life in the resurrection, so too are we invited to rise. We are invited to live in a way that isn't easier, but live in a way that is truly better, more reflective of God's kingdom. 
and of all of our places in that kingdom. So I have to confess, the day that my husband took the leg lamp to the post office, I didn't even notice that it had left the house. It had been living buried in our basement for some time, and I'd forgotten about it. As I forgot about things, between the leg lamp sightings over the years. And as glad as I was to see this leg lamp go, don't tell him, (laughs) but I'm also glad that the leg lamp was there. Though it should have been in our home for many years less than it was. My thankfulness for the leg lamp has absolutely nothing to do with my husband's own pride or prowess in fantasy football. But in the way that this leg lamp is a talisman of the relationships that he built and he is building with people that I deeply love. I wonder, too, at the man building the tower and the king about to go off to war, about the missteps that were taken, but also the wisdom that isn't really accredited in this passage. The king did not sacrifice his men to save his pride. He did not send them to war anyway. The man building the tower let it be unfinished, even at his own ridicule and expense. He did not keep building, maybe ruining himself and his family in the process. Instead, he chose to look foolish. Maybe our unfinished business, when aired with honesty, is allowed to take another light. Maybe we are able to tell another story. And the telling of another story is an act of transformation and resurrection. So, may we all bring our leg lamps out of the basement and mail them off to their next homes, recognizing what was and living into what could be for all of us. Amen. I have to confess that I also own one of those leg lamps. <laughs> In this case, my wife bought it. We both think it's great. So, <laughs> teach their own. <laughs> Friends, beloved in Christ, we are called to this table to receive God's grace. Not that This is the end of the story, but rather the beginning, because we leave this table carrying that grace with us, sharing it with others, and doing the business of God's work, earning the grace that we have been freely given. Friends, Luke the Evangelist wrote of our risen Savior, who at the table with his disciples took bread, blessed it, and shared it with them. By this sacrament, Each and every one of us is brought together at a common table. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or joining us online, the cup that we bring and the bread that we share 
are blessed in this sacrament, as we are all blessed in the presence of God's Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus Christ here at the table with us. All who wish to know the love of God are welcome here at this table. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Praise be to the Lord God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth, giving breath to every living thing. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of creation and the gift of life itself. We thank you for creating us in your image and for keeping us and sustaining us in your steadfast care. Lord, we come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ who lived and walked among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross, to be raised from the dead on the third day, and who lives in glory. Therefore, we praise you, Lord, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your holy name. pray everlasting God send your Holy Spirit upon this bread and fruit of the vine grant that all who share in the communion of the body and blood of our risen Savior may be one in Jesus Christ Lord of the living and of the dead and we remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion Jesus gathered with his disciples And after giving thanks to God, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and shared it with his friends, saying, Take this and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And much in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And again, after giving thanks to God, he poured it and blessed it and shared it with his friends saying take this and drink this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me and now ministering to you in the name of our lord jesus christ we offer you this bread and this cup the bread of heaven cup of God's salvation. And now with mind, body, and soul, sustained by God's eternal love, let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. We thank you, O God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, amen.
Friends, let us go forward from this place filled with God's love and God's courage that we do not have to leave unfinished business, that we can be filled and transformed and inspired by God's Holy Spirit to be that source of love and light in the world. Amen.